Okay, beloved, we're going to be talking tonight about uh, London Baptist Confession and its concept of the covenant, or London Baptist Confession federalism, because that's what it means. Fidus in Latin means the covenant, so the covenant concept of London Baptist Confession of 1689. As you, many of my Baptist friends and otherwise in Presbyterian and River, whoever else, you know, Southern Grace, you, you know, it's a, it's a well-known uh, uh, confessional document which has been kind of revised. Uh, it was not, I mean, if the first edition was, I guess, 1644, the, uh, uh, the uh, particular Baptist Confession. Then it got to uh, this form of London Baptist Confession of 1689. And if you look at the document, if you read, especially those of you who are strict confessionalist, uh, confessionalist uh, you know that uh, it's framed and worded in point of fact, just uh, as a carbon copy of the Westminster Confession of Faith. In point of fact, if, if you put them side by side and if you read them, I mean, even the wording is, is the same. So the and since the Westminster Confession of Faith uh, came around right in, in 1641, 1644, I guess was the was it or even 41? I you, you know you'll correct me, but in the 40s, like 48, I guess 49 was the was the time that it was completed. The, the Westminster Standards, uh, the first document, as I recall, was. Uh, the catechism, the larger catechism, then followed the confession and the, the shorter catechism. I guess that that's the order of that, even though, I mean, I may be wrong, but who cares, you know, ultimately. But the point is that the London Baptist Confession of 1689 is clearly a derivative uh, document. It was kind of a copied. It's a version which uh, takes a lot from the Presbyterian counterpart and the 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 Presbyterian counterpart, the Presbyterian document, is the primary. The London Baptist Confession follows, and it makes some revisions. Some, some of them are significant about Baptists, as you might uh, suppose, and and some other articles. But uh, essentially, it follows uh, pretty closely, even in wording, you know. And therefore, therefore, since. They're almost like twin brothers, you know, LBE, uh, London Baptist Confession, and the uh, pres uh, the Westminster Confession. Therefore, this Baptist document of 1689 inherits both good and evil from the Westminster Confession of Faith. When I say evil, of course, I mean it's, it's a kind of a relative term in this. And so, but there are some things that I'm not comfortable with in the Westminster Confession of Faith, and almost the same things are have been in, incorporated in the London Baptist uh, Confession of Faith. So I have kind of disagreements with both, and for the same reason, because they basically follow the same pattern. And mainly, mainly, they concern the the subject matter at hand, which is the covenant. Both London Baptist and the uh, Westminster place this in the seventh chapter in their, in their respective uh, documents of God's covenant with man. I think that that's the name of it. It's in its, in its chapter set, both Westminster and uh, London Baptist confession. And it's interesting, if you read the, the first uh, paragraph the very first paragraph of, uh, <coughs> excuse me, London Baptist and Westminster, you have, in essence, the main issue, the main problem, for me, uh, at least. <clears throat> this is what it says. The distance, uh, the distance of God's covenant the distance between God and the creature is so great that although reasonable creatures do owe obedience to Him as their Creator, yet they could never have attained the reward of life but by some voluntary condescension of, on God's part, which He hath been pleased to express <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> by way of covenant. This is my third recording today, so I kind of, my voice is getting a little hoarse. Sorry about that. <clears throat> anyway, 
but you can uh, you can observe that uh, easily that according to this statement, all right, the distance between the creator and the, cre the creatures is so great that even though the creatures owe all obedience, they can offer and so so forth, and uh, but they could never have any fruition of, of blessing on the part of God if God had not condescended to make a covenant with men. A voluntary condescension on God's part, which have been pleased to express by way of covenant. All right, so you guys, your creatures, I'm, I'm God the Creator, all right? You owe me all obedience in the world, but you could never attain to any promise, any, any blessing, uh, any bliss, any happiness, Unless I voluntarily, and and therefore by you know by inference, uh, arbitrarily, if I if I don't condescend and make a covenant, so you you get the point. The covenant, the idea of the covenant that it is something non-essential, that is something arbitrary that God could have done. The idea is that He could have gone on without the covenant, but He condescended. And he made it's something additional, something non-essential, totally voluntary on, on God's part, and he expressed it in order for man to attain to some blessings. Okay. So it is non-essential, it is uh something additional, it's not a nature of God Himself. Please note well, and it is a means unto an end. In order for creatures to get any blessings, all right, any reward, there had to be a covenant. And therefore, a covenant is a means unto an end, all right? So, and here you have the, uh, the, the problem. And uh, it's also further expressed that it's, it's a the idea is very common for traditional Reformed theology. The traditional Reformed theology, both Baptist and Presbyterian, it makes no difference at this point. They both view a covenant as essentially as an agreement, okay? A pact, a contract, a treaty, bilateral, with obligations, blessings, curses, but it's a mechanical kind of thing, quid pro quo, okay? I'll do this, you do that, okay? And if you don't, I'm going to get you for that. Or if you're good, if you're bidden, you will be getting this with promises, with certain benefits from this contract, okay? It is a very fundamental, traditional notion of God's covenant as fundamental as agreement, okay? All right, it's been... Um, th there have been attempts by different Reformed theologians to a little to spruce it up, this me mechanical idea, so as to look at it from different angles. All right, it's more unilateral because God is big and man is so small, infinitely small, and therefore... It cannot be viewed as a bilateral agreement. It's more or less that God commanding his, his covenant, imposing his will. But nevertheless, in essence, it is still some sort of an agreement, a binding agreement upon the creature, but an agreement nonetheless, according to the traditional understanding. And it is a means unto an end. Now, over against this uh, perception of God's covenant is... What I perceive to be scriptural, a Christological idea of God's covenant as a bond, sacred bond, or union of friendship and love, which is realized, established, confirmed through the blood of Jesus Christ, who is the mediator and indeed the very essence of the covenant. I remind you that in Isaiah, let me get it um, for you in King James, in Isaiah 42, verse 6, 
uh, it says, I, the Lord, have called thee in righteousness and will hold thine hand and will keep thee and give thee for a covenant of the people, for a light of the Gentiles. So Christ himself is the covenant, according to Isaiah 42, 6 and elsewhere. He is, indeed, in him we live and move and have our being. Paul repeatedly uses this phrase, in Christ, in him we have this. In him we have redemption. In him, he is the center and indeed the hub of everything that is of any salvific significance in the Bible. He is our, our priest. He is the God-man. He is the temple. He is where God and man meet together, where mercy and righteousness, holiness and love, all of those things come together in him. And we are in him. He is the Indeed, the marrow of God's covenant. And if you think of the closest uh, picture of Christ's covenant with his church, it is what? It is the covenant of marriage. All right. And according to Paul in Philippians 5, it is so much more than a simple marriage contract. It is a union, indeed a mysterious union of one flesh, where the two become one flesh. And that's the reason why Christ loves the church, because we are his body, of his flesh and of his bones indeed. Therefore, we will be with him forever. And it's not just some contract. It is a sacred union union of friendship and love established in the blood of Jesus Christ. This is the orthodox uh, understanding. It was, was first propounded, set forth by a famous American Dutch, Dutch American uh, Reformed theologian, Herman Hoeksema, who was the founder of a uh, denomination, small uh, Reformed denomination in the States, which is called Protestant Reformed Churches in America, PRCA. All right. Now, there have been some others who kind of try to uh, look at it from, from the same, but none has expressed it so clearly as Herman Hussein. And I think he's absolutely right on this. Also, if, you know, the covenant is a means to an end, then when the end has been achieved... The purpose of bliss, happiness, and so forth. Then you can do away with the contract. This agreement no longer is needed. But the Bible says something else. That the very culmination, the end of all things in the book of Revelation. Almost the last thing that we read is behold God's tabernacle with man. The vision of the heavenly Jerusalem in Revelation 21 descending from heaven. It is the picture Indeed, a metaphorical uh, description, not to be taken too woodenly little, but it is nevertheless expressing the beauty and uh, uh, complete happiness of the dwelling, sojourning of God and his elect people in this heavenly Jerusalem. All right, I will be their God, they shall be my people forever. And that's the essence of the covenant. It's never done away with. It's not an, an agreement. It is this bond, union of God and his elect people. That's the essence. Uh, bond of love and, uh, and friendship. Also, there's something else. You know, this uh, talking of London Baptist Confession... Since it is a carbon copy, almost, some, some additions, but minor changes, but it basically follows the Westminster, and therefore it also follows the Westminster, erroneously, in the insistence that moral law, the Decalogue, is still a rule of life and gratitude 
for the redeemed. So the Christians honor the moral law, even though it's not a it's not a covenant that works any longer. That sting has been removed by Christ. Nevertheless, it's still binding us, and so it's so they pretty much follow. They have the chapter on God's law, and they, and they say repeat the same thing as the Westminster does on this issue, and they're both wrong uh, on on this thing because the. Letter that killeth this uh, um, the law written upon the tables of stone was a ministry of condemnation. It was even worded in such a way so as to um, work wrath. Eight of the commandments <coughs> are given as direct <coughs> prohibitions. Thou shalt not, thou shalt not this, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not commit adultery, and so forth. <coughs> thou shalt have no other gods before me. All of this shalt not. Now, any honest person, uh, indeed regenerate person, will know that they are breaking all these commandments all the time, almost in a non-stop of fashion, especially the the tenth commandment, for Pete's sake, thou shalt not covet, and we do covet so many levels. Each time we desire something else than what God has given us, or we think, oh boy, I wish, I wish I could have this and that. We're breaking it, breaking one commandment. We're guilty of transgressing the whole law and so forth. You know it. So if you make it into rule of life, you, your conscience gets hurt. The law bites you. You know that uh, you just, all you do is that uh, you just register your sinning. That you fall short. Thou shalt not. And you, point of fact, you do commit all those things and so forth. So it's not, a, and, and it accounts for legalism, the covenant legalism, which is also, uh, in my opinion, uh, present in the Reformed Baptist circles, just as in the in Reformed and, and Presbyterian, when they the, the proclaim the law as the rule of uh, uh, gratitude and life, it becomes a condemning uh, factor. Guilt increasing, and therefore people get unhappy when they're not happy. They'll try to find somebody else who's less uh, successful in outward attempts to be nice and God fearing. Then they'll blame somebody else and they put their fingers holy than thou. Attitude is promoted by this concept of the perpetuity of moral law, that it binds us and so forth and so forth. Well, it is delivered us from the law. Now, as far as the moral precepts, of course they exist. Of course God is moral and Christians are to be moral. But it's not the law. It is the commandments. The Paul does, does not even use the word law when he gives all his commandments, various commandments that are, yes, they're very much... Um, their commandments, they're addressed to us, they're necessary in, in, in terms of, uh, and they're not optional, God commands that we do them, keeping God's commandments in forth, but it's, it's, it's a different, it's not a system of law under which you are condemned, it's a different thing, it's family rules, if you will, and those family rules, as expressed in, um, Philippians 2, for instance, they express something for us which is of the nature of God himself as the eternal essence of the covenant. See, we have the Holy Trinity. Our God is a triune God in whom we have the unity and diversity and selfless love eternally going on. Think of this thing. God loveth the Son. He sends His Son. The Son comes not to do His will, but to do His 
Father's will of him that sent him. Then he promises the Spirit, the Comforter, who will come, and the Spirit will do what? He will remind you, he will teach you about the Son. He will glorify, he will do, will go out of his way to bring glory to the Son's finished work. That's the function of the Spirit, not to do all this crazy stuff as the Charismatics claim. No. But he will remind you. He will open your eyes. He will explain to you what the Son has done. And what the Son has done reflects the goodness, love, and faithfulness of the Father. His wisdom, His justice, His all find expression in his perfect image, i.e. the Son. Do you get the point? It is the in the, the Trinity. You have the selfless given uh, um, eternally all, all the time. Now, uh, I want to show you something. I want to show you. In Philippians 2, the famous chapter, even uh, the New Testament commandments reflect for us the nature of God's covenant as the bond of love and friendship. All right? It says in Philippians 2, 3, listen to this. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Is that interesting that when Paul says to the Christian husbands to love their wives, he doesn't say, well, husbands, love your wives because the seventh commandment, thou shalt not commit adultery. Love your wives because you can't commit adultery. He doesn't say so. He says, love husbands, love your wives, even as Christ loved the church. And gave himself for her. This is going beyond the ladder of the law, which says, in essence, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. But Christ, through Paul, says, love your wives more than yourselves, because Christ gave himself, laid down his life for his church. In essence, he lost his life for the sake of the church. So he actually, he fulfilled this. In loneliness of my ledge, each esteem other better than themselves. This is, beloved, not just a commandment delivered to us. Yes, it is a commandment to us all, but it's also a reflection of the covenant life within the Holy Trinity because that's the pattern of this divine love which is taking place eternally within the Trinity. The Father loves the Son. The Son loves the Father. The Spirit loves the Son and loves the Father. The Father sends the, uh, I mean, the Spirit, uh, uh, what, what, what is this, uh, procession. His Spirit is the Spirit, and what, whatever the terms he use, it is kind of a selfless given in love and trust and not seeking their own. Let not every man on his own thing, look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Esteeming others better than themselves, and foregoing certain pleasures, as Paul says, that look, if it makes anyone to stumble, I won't eat meat, I won't do anything that causes a brother to stumble. Why is he saying that? It's not because he's loving his neighbor as himself. He's loving them better than himself. He's steaming them. He's following Christ, and Christ follows the pattern of God himself in the Trinity. And that's the life of the covenant God. Okay? So back to the uh, 
uh, London Baptist Confession, uh, Confession of Federalism, the London Baptist Confession of 1689 falls short. It, uh, it, you know, it really follows the Westminster, the very uh, mechanic uh, uh, perception of the covenant as an agreement, pact, or you know, uh, ultimately contract. But it, it fails to do justice to the richness and the mystery of the covenant which is expressed in, in Christ Jesus. And that's, that's my main beef. Uh, of course, the legalism as well. The, I could also mention the, the how, maybe I should, uh, how the, uh, the covenant grace is expressed because it also lifts the door open to the uh, so-called well-meant offer. All right, let me read to you. Paragraph two from this uh, chapter on the on the on the covenant then will be done. Okay, uh, it says, uh, moreover, man having brought himself under the curse of the law by his fall, it pleased the Lord to make a covenant of grace. Now, note well that those of you who who know the Westminster Confession of Faith, it has the the the, the second uh, paragraph in the in the seventh chapter of the covenant. It has the whole paragraph on the covenant of works. <clears throat> now, it's omitted here in the Long Baptist. It is mentioned by name the covenant of works elsewhere in the same confession so they they didn't avoid the covenant of works they still believe it but they did they decided to leave this paragraph here but listen to this moreover man having brought himself under the curse of the law by by his fall it pleased the lord to make a covenant of grace wherein he freely offers unto sinners life and salvation by jesus christ requiring of them faith in him that they may be saved and promising to give unto all those that are ordained unto eternal life his Holy Spirit to make them willing and able to believe. Now, <clears throat> here you have uh, something that uh, makes a covenant into a uh, into arena or a home into which you must get jumping through a hurdle. Okay, something, some obstacle that you've got to overcome. See, he freely offers. There is this uh, notion of the offer of life and salvation by Jesus Christ. Okay, requiring of sinners faith in him. So it's something that faith is kind of an outside of the covenant, something that you must fulfill a condition in order to enter into this covenant. At least it can be interpreted that way. I'm not necessarily insisting. But people say, well, look, offer... Uh, in the days of the Westminster theologians in the 17th century, man, something else, just setting forth. So Christ is just being set forth in the preaching. Oh, yeah, all right, okay, no problem, I'll take that. But it also says requiring uh, of them faith in him. But that certainly communicates this notion that if they fulfill that obligation, that due to faith, then they will be uh, entitled to the blessings of that covenant. But again, it's some, it's some arrangement that is a means unto a further end. Whereas, the more scriptural, Christological uh, understanding of the covenant is that the covenant is the essence, the mystery of the Holy Trinity. It is the mystery of Christ and His Church. It is the sacred bond union a friendship and love between God and His people in Christ Jesus. This is the essence of the covenant. All right, all right. I've said enough, and uh, hopefully, this has been a provocative study in a good way that will provoke you to further study of scriptures. Then, I've accomplished uh, my goal. All right. God bless you all. Talk to you next time.